Thank you, Steady. <laughs> and uh, and we, um, we've been in this business since 1992 <clears throat> in one way or another. We've been in the crew charter space. We've been in the bare boat charter space. Uh, we've been in the yacht sales space. So, you know, we've probably made every mistake that's possible to be made. And the objects of our websites and our communities to try and help people not make all the stupid mistakes. But OK, so let's follow this up. Um, What's happened over the last year, we found, is that crew charter has become more and more popular. One of the reasons, I think, with COVID, what's happened is, is that um, pe people that, that, you know, that used to do no charter would show up um, and get their, their technical briefing, their, their chart briefing, their inventory out, etc. And based on that, uh, you know, they would they would get out, you know, sometimes they do a sleeper board, but it was a relatively quick process. With COVID, that's become laborious. Um, so crew charter suddenly became a much more attractive uh, proposition because you would show up at a charter base, um, you're in a crude yacht, you have your social pod, so everybody knows everybody, you get on the boat with the captain, generally they've been tested regularly, so we know they're clear. You, you put your you put your bags down, take your pina colada, and you're off. So the crew charter definitely has become a very very robust sector of the market versus bare boat, which has really struggled in this in the in the in, in the pandemic in pandemic simply because of access and also because of all the all the um, thank you Sharon um, <laughs> and and uh, because of the, the hassle there is to do to do bare boat where versus crew, which is a very very easy. Um, way to do it. So in the last 12 months, we've seen a very, very big swing or trend towards crewed boats. We, we've sold a lot of crewed boats into, into this crewed charter space. What we do at Catamaran Guru is we help owners buy, buy charter boats. We help them and advise them on how to equip them. Um, and we and and obviously we you know oh with, my goodness I'm having technical with the difficulties here I'm afraid sorry. <laughs> And with and with the purchase process, we help spec the boats properly. We also are pretty involved in placing boats and helping people get into different uh, different charter environments. Um, there are many environments in crew charter, from sailing schools to captain only to owner operators to the to the luxury crew with with hired and professional crew. All right, so there you see it. The global market for crew is definitely growing. While the global market for uh, for for bear boat is 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 taking a bit of a hit, and you know we're not sure. We just heard today that Europe has started locking down again, which is really disappointing or just you know bad news. Um, so crude, especially crude for, gonna, for bear boats, right? Yeah, I mean, bear that's boats. A, and that's a, we we found that um, with the the cruise ship, the cruise ship business, they are also locked down. So people are just they they just want to get out, they just want to travel, and this is the safest, easiest way to do that yeah. is go on a crude yacht. You're contained with your social pod. So um, we've just seen leaps and bounds of, of development in this area. Yeah. I mean, you know, in the old days, you used to, you used to go on a cruise with 3,000 of your closest friends. <laughs> Today, you go with, uh, you know, six or eight of your closest friends. And people think that it's very expensive to, to, to charter a cruise yacht. It's not really that expensive. You know, you get boats that start from about, you know, a 45-foot boat, fully crewed, luxury, gourmet, gourmet food, water toys, et cetera, starts at about $17,000 a week, um, which averages out at about $2,830 per person, which is really, I mean, in a, in a luxury hotel, you pretty much, uh, you know, it's on a par. And if you flip back and look at what a same size uh, bear boat charter boat would cost, it's not really very much than the actual crude boat. So what we've seen is the global market for charter is absolutely growing. I mean, it was estimated 6.6 .6 billion um, and it's projected to reach 9.3 billion by two 2027. So there's a lot of space in the crude charter market uh, for growth. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just, it's 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 one of the it's one of the, the sectors of the market <clears throat> that COVID has driven through the roof. So let's look at who would be interested in owning a crude yacht. The first group are people that 
want to change in lifestyle or change in career, just sick and tired of the the, the day to day drudge of being in corporate in corporate life. That has been probably the biggest sector of of people that that's come to us lately. I want to say in the last six months to a year, um, people who you know, been thinking about this for a long time and actually now just taking the plunge. I'm sure there's a there's a few of you here right now. Yeah, you know, the owner operator mm -hmm. concept is great. Uh, that's we, we've been in the owner operator concept. Mm -hmm. We ran a, a liverboard sailing school week long liverboard sailing schools in the Bahamas for quite a few years. So, you know, the, the actual oper owner operator concept is, is, is really good. And it's a great experience uh, for, for, for people that are chartering the boat. Yeah. Um, the next sector are people who are high net worth, are able to buy a boat in 48 to 50 foot size and, and bigger. And there you have professional crew who, who operate the boat. And th these crew are, you have the captain mm. and you have the hostess who's normally a very, very well qualified chef. Um, so between them, they offer a great experience, but they're, and, and they, but they're, they're employed crew and they operate the boat. They make their money from tips. So obviously they work like crazy to satisfy and make sure there's a great experience yeah. because that affects their income. Of course, they they uh, maintain the boat, they clean the boat, they um, and they make sure that their their guests are absolutely carried on their hands because you know that's that's how they make the money. So your boat is always in tip top shape. Yeah, and then there's another sector that's popped its head up in the last couple of months or mm -hmm. the last year, and that is owners who who are really concerned about the condition of their boat at the end of its service. Bare boat has always been a pretty robust sector. Um, and people haven't really worried about the condition of the boat to the degree they are today uh, because they had the, the exchange, they were sailing all over the world, they had, they had that experience and the boat was a means to an end. What's happening is people are becoming more and more concerned about the condition of the boat, how the boat's protected during its service and what, you know, what it's going to look like at the end Sorry. of the service. Right. <clears throat> now to the nitty gritty, how it works. <laughs> <clears throat> so... Um, First step, you have to buy the boat. Now, um, if and we will discuss this a little further in, um, as well. Uh, buying the boat from a dealer, um, and you fit out your boat to to fit the profile for a crew charter boat. Yeah, let me just. just uh, you don't need to buy your boat from a dealer per se. Right. Um, you know there are many very very, uh, very uh, good quality charter boats that are used. The operators have operated for five, seven, eight, ten years. And they still have a charter life in them. A charter boat, a crew charter boat probably has a life of 15 years plus uh, because they've been properly maintained their entire life. So, you know, you can either buy it from a dealer or you can buy it, you know, through Catamaran Guru, we deal factory direct. So we obviously deal with many brands and we're able to uh, facilitate the purchase of a boat. We would assist you in the uh, equipping of the boat. So you have the correct equipment, et cetera. So you don't necessarily have to go new you can go used. Right. Um, just just a, a quick one. Um, if, if we're going to have a question and answer at the end of the of the presentation. So I'm sure a lot of you will have um, uh, questions for us. So just hang in there. We're going to go through this and then, um, you know, we'll, we'll give you the chance to to chat with us. Okay, so basically, once you've bought your boat, you've equipped it, you know, a luxury charter boat, it needs air conditioning, water makers, generators, electric toilets, uh, you know, good bimini's, good awnings, a nice dinghy center console, hopefully with a big outboard for water sports, you know, kayaks, all the rest of it. So once you have your boat, what are you going to do with it, right? So let's take a region, the Virgin Islands. Um, in the Virgin Islands, you have what are called clearing houses. Now, clearing houses are companies that operate and hold a calendar. And they, they are facilitate the booking of the boat. The, the largest group of people that book boats are the charter brokers. Charter brokers are very experienced people who've been in this business a long time and understand what a luxury crew charter is all about. What the, what the menu is? What if the, if 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 you know you have any any allergies that you that that, that have to be catered for? Um, what sort of alcohol you would like on board? What sort of water toys you would like on board? Whether you'd like to have a dive during your your charter your charter. So your charter brokers are a critical part of this. They're very important yeah. people because they will they will tailor make your charter for you. Uh, 
So once you once you have your charter broker and you've tailor made your charter, then they will go and have a look at what the best fit is, and they will go to the clearinghouse. The clearinghouse holds the calendar for all the boats, and most of these brokers know all of the boats. So what will happen is that <clears throat> that, that, that the, the, the charter broker will then book with the clearinghouse. The owner will pay between a two, 1.5 to 3% fee. It's called a clearinghouse fee. So now you have your boat, you have a, net, you, you, you have a, a, a source of bookings, and you have your calendar. Right. Now, usually, just just a quick uh, uh, note here is that the way the the charter brokers get to know the boats and the crews is that they will um, the, the the boats will display at these boat shows in the BVI or Antigua or St Martin or wherever, and uh, the the brokers go and actually meet the crews and they tour the boats so that they personally know what they're presenting to their clients. So it's a very close relationship with the boat and and the and the crew. Yeah, generally you'll find if you book through a charter broker, that's really good. They will pr pretty much have met the crew. They will know the boat. They will have been on the boat. So your charter broker is an important person in this process. Um, so the, the charter brokers generally will earn a fee of 15%. We're speaking now from the owner's perspective. So the, the owner is now at 18% of 100%. These are the costs that are, in, that, that, that are incurred. Um, the last piece is, you have two types of boats. You have boats that are managed, and there are a lot of management companies out there that manage boats. They manage the crews. They keep make sure budgets are adhered to. They, they, they make sure that there's maintenance. If there's a problem, they take care of maintenance. They're pretty important people as well if you're, if you're new. Um, we reckon that if you're new, you should be in a management company without a doubt uh, because you have that, that you have that network and infrastructure to support your boat. Um, the numbers we're giving here are averages. They're not specific. You know, this is this is ballpark. Um, pretty much, you're looking at about a 15% fee for management, and they'll manage everything. So you basically have a real hands-off experience in terms of the management of the boat. Um, so you know, that's 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 the one that's that's the one uh, operation. The other way to do it is if you're an experienced operator, been in the business for a long time. The brokers will know you, you'll be able to handle your own maintenance, and you need a clearinghouse which the brokers can book your boat through. So those are the two, those are the two sort of options that you're faced with. Generally, you'll start with the full Monty, and as you become more experienced, you will start self-managing and you'll and you will eventually probably end up as a self-managed boat with a good relationship with the clearinghouse, and the brokers will like you because they've they've had good feedback from their right. clients about you. So most of our owners of catamarans over 50 foot, these catam uh, place these catamarans into one of several crude programs. Okay, the basic idea is 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 operated as a business. So here here is another dimension to the crude thing. If you are looking to offset the cost of ownership, we're able to assist you in structuring a business so that the Cost a major part of the operation is offset by available tax advantages that are are um, allowed by the IRS. So, so you know, for example, depreciation. If you're running a business, you're able to depreciate the vessel. You're able to write off the cost of maintenance, insurance, dockage. These are all legitimate business costs, which will substantially reduce the cost of ownership. Um, so there are two types. As we said already, owner operators with the luxury crude, and we have professionally crude luxury charter boats. Those are the, the, the two sort of bandwidths. We're not going to talk about sailing schools and captain only charters and by the cabin charters. So th there's a lot of different options, but these are the two we're speaking about tonight. Tell you what, at this stage, Casey, are you there? I'm here, guys. Okay. okay. So, Casey, these are frequently asked questions. Uh, and we're going to bounce. We're going to bounce a few of them off of you. Okay. Um, so, what do you think the best, the best sort of setup and type of boat is for for crude? Um, generally, that would be anything forty five feet or larger. Um, at least uh, you know three guest cabins available, um, and and or more. Um, you know, traditionally a six pack, which we call a six person. Um, charter would be on a four cabin vessel because the crew generally takes one cabin for themselves because they are living on board full time. You know, they're not 
not going to be comfortable sleeping in four peaks um, like you would maybe see on a bear belt where you just add a skipper. Um, and yeah, so I would say anything 45 feet or, or larger, we have been seeing a lot of demand for actually like 10 pack vessels. Um, so that would be, you know, six cabin vessel where five of those are made available to, uh, to guests. So that'll be like a Lagoon 50, right? Yep, Lagoon 50, yeah. Saba, Saba 50, one Saba of those. 50, yep. Yeah. Bali 48 also has, um, well, that, that's a great eight pack boat. Uh, Bali 54, you know, we can do 10 pack on that. Okay, so, and these boats generally are super well equipped um, with air conditioning, generator, water maker, et cetera. Um, so if you're in the buying side of it and you're looking, for, you're looking to purchase a yacht, um, you want to have a look at a few aspects of it. Uh, as Casey said, we have six pack and eight pack. These mean, when they say eight pack or six pack or 10 pack, that means how many people the boat can carry. And obviously, the more people it can carry, the more desirable it is for people that are going mm -hmm. on events like maybe anniversary or birthdays, etc. cetera. Um, so you've got to consider the number of cabins. You definitely have to consider the fact that the crew have to be comfortable. You don't want a crew that have to sleep in four peaks. They'll be angry and won't give the customers very good service. But you really want to concentrate yeah, on, I mean, on it's, them. It's their home yeah. too. So, you know, they you, you have to look this is this is a business you're on 24 7 so and then you know sometimes it's 10 day charter it it takes a lot out of you and you want your crew to be fairly comfortable when they get away in their own little um space yeah you know i always tell people sorry to mean to cut you off Stephen. go ahead it, I always tell people it's like a circle, you know, every chain, every person in the circle, the owner, the broker, the crew, um, everybody needs to be happy. And if you keep your crew happy, they do a good job to keep your client happy, which in turn gives you good reviews, which has repeat business. And then the other thing um, to mention on the cabins there, storage is another thing to consider because on, on crew charters, you have to outfit the boat with everything you know we're outfitting it like a boutique hotel mm -hmm. so guests don't really realize that sometimes the crew cabin actually becomes extra storage you know <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah and you know you in order to, to to give this experience you need to you need to have a water maker so you can't say well you can shower for three minutes today sorry um <laughs> you know you've got to have, you've got to have a good supply of water um the crew dishwashers are really make make life easier for the crew yeah. uh you know you want to have televisions you know, maybe the people don't want to watch TV, but they might want to might have been diving and they might have got some really good pictures and want to put them up on a screen. And so basically you want to have a good good television, good electronics, etc. You know, electric heads are pretty much a yeah, must these days. You absolutely. don't want to be standing there pumping a, a marine head. It's not a great experience, I can assure you. I've done it for 25 years. So, you know, yeah. uh, you want, you want, you know, at night you would obviously run the generator. Uh, and so each cabin needs to have an individually controlled uh, climate control. So if you like it colder than the other guy, doesn't matter. You, you know, you, 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 can, you can choose, you have different zones for air conditioning, et cetera. So pretty, pretty important, the spec of the boat. All right, so the next slide. This is a question for you, Casey. What does the standard crew charter include? So that's a great question. I get this one a lot. Um, so basically the charters are all inclusive and they include everything except for the gratuity for the crew, which the industry standard is 15 to 20% of the charter rate. The only thing outside of that would be if there's any premium beverage requests or any thing that the client wants to set up on shore, like any shore excursions, or they want to rent a car, things like that. So it's a great rate because you don't have to worry about anything. It's a flat fee um, and really just have to bring cash for the um, crew gratuity or, or set up with PayPal or Venmo. And Casey, uh, do they eat aboard every night or is there, are, are they compulsory eating ashore nights? For the game. For the guests. Yeah. It's not compulsory. Um, they definitely have, what that includes is um, meals every day, breakfast, lunch, appetizer, dinner, and dessert daily. However, it is very common for the charter guests to eat on shore at least one lunch and one dinner. We also have other options that would be um, half board or local fare option where if they know that they wanna eat um, on shore uh, a lot, then we would recommend, as a charter broker, we would recommend a half board where that would be half the lunches and half the dinners are taken on shore at the client expense. So we have options, we can customize it basically. Um, I've also had you know certain charter brokers where they say, hey, my client really only wants to go out to shore like 
two dinners and, and one lunch, can we work out something? So there's different fair schedules that we can work out. Casey, does the crew get to use the yacht when they're not on charter? Well, they do live on board, so they are able to utilize the yacht within the cruising grounds that they are designated for. Um, what, however, with that being said, um, that doesn't mean they can throw parties on the boat. They're a professional yacht crew, um, but they can have, you know, a guest over. They can you they can sail around from, you know, St. John to St. Thomas, that sort of thing. But whenever they want to use it for their own personal use, um, let's say they wanted to travel into the BVI, you know, in a normal non-COVID world, um, they would be responsible for the fuel, for the customs and clearances, for any moorings, things like that. Um, but generally, if it's operational cost for, you know, they're keeping the boat off, out of a marina, saving on dockage fees, we're not charging them moorings to go, you know, to, to stay, um, you know, at the national park, that type of thing. That's going to be an operational cost that the owner would bear. Right. Uh, but usually uh, the, the owner and the crew de develop quite a close, close relationship, I would imagine, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And um, so how long is that contract for? Generally, the contract is for a year or a season. Um, I've seen crew contracts that are 10 months. I've seen them that are 12 months. It also depends on whether the owner, when it keeps the yacht in charter for um, that entire time, or, you know, traditionally we have seen, we have had, kind of had a season where the season would run from um, August, middle of August, uh, I'm sorry, from middle of October to late August, and then charter yachts would head you know, down island to the Grenadines and kind of haul out and, and the crew would go on vacation for two months. So that is one model. Um, but lately, you know, it's, if your insur insurance allows it, um, then you can stay into charter for a full year if the crew is okay with that. Right. An interesting model that I'm seeing is split crew now, yeah. where you have six months crew. I just spoke to an owner the other day who has a, a, a Lagoon 620, and I actually sold him the boat, and they operate 12 months around, and, and, and they have six months on, six months off crew. Um, I think Lady Kettle said that, mm -hmm. right? So right. there are a couple of the 620s that, that, that pick up a lot of business, mm -hmm. and what they do is they've been doing the 50 50 is that still do you see that a lot casey or is that uh actually Stephen, i've seen that come back into play a lot more recently um and i've even seen it where uh you know that the year is broken up into quarters and what you know they'll do two two different quarters um or one crew will take three quarters and the other will take a quarter um but yeah i think that's a great great model that's becoming more common um, to allow the owner to keep the boat into charter, but yet also not burning out the crew. And especially if it's an established crew, um, you can go ahead and post that on the boat's listing. So, hey, from this month to this month, this is your crew, and this month to this month, here's the other crew. And then that way, that alleviates the concern of not knowing who your crew is going to be. The brokers are all happy. They, they know exactly who the crew will be depending on when they book the boat. Well, I know Stephen and I used to do uh, sailing schools and boy, after the third week of being on 24 seven, you really get a little crabby, you know, <laughs> and you just need to take a break. So I, I know what it's like. And, and if you have to do that for, for six months at a time, it, it can really get to you. Especially if you're doing 24 hour turns for yeah. four weeks in a row, then they need a break because you, you want to make sure they're, they're giving the same level of service on the fourth charter as on the first charter. Look, I'm not known for being crabby, but uh, <laughs> but I can tell you that you know we we did we did 17 weeks of sailing school in the Bahamas one season, yeah. and I was really <laughs> crabby when we left there. I, I I couldn't get out of there fast enough, of, you know, when the season closed. So I I feel for yeah. the crew. It's it's, it's a it's a very job. tough job to have that smile on your face 24 hours a day. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. Good question. How is maintenance handled? Well. Maintenance is it has different levels. Um, you know, your crew, if you're employing a crew, you're paying them a salary. So you're expecting the boat to be well clean, polished, stainless clean. Uh, generally, a uh, good crew will know how to, to service engines, uh, change filters, clean filters, etc. Major maintenance, obviously, you need to you need to farm out to the local, uh, you know, the local technical services. Again, you know, at Catamaran Guru, we've developed a great relationship now in the Virgin Islands with some really good technical people. So there's there's good technical service available. Um, for example, if you need engine service or if you need a, a major component changed 
or anything to do with you know engines or rigging etc there's pretty much vendors for the whole lot of it you know for they cover the whole spectrum and uh, casey i mean how do you i mean you that that's pretty much we're using the major guys down there right yeah uh we you know i have a ton of contacts there um and generally the captains and the crews develop contacts with their favorite vendors everything from provisioners to interior cleaners exterior cleaners if they have a um, a 24-hour return or something and same with on the maintenance side and the technical side um we all kind of have our list of people that we go to whether it's rigging engines whatever generators water maker whatever we need okay. ah here's another good one for you uh, Casey, Casey. <laughs> tell, tell tell everybody about the, the the u.s coast guard qualifications and RY qualifications because you're employing these crews so you're pretty pretty familiar with all of this so in general um if you have a u.s uh flagged vessel you're going to need a u.s um passport holder as the captain um, and crew and the captain has to have a uscg master credential and along with every crew member must have an stcw endorsement if they're sailing into international waters right now you know we're kind of stuck in the usbi although we've made it a destination of its own um but yeah so in general they need the master's credential and the stcw endorsement if they have a foreign flagged vessel um then the rya or comparable would also be acceptable Okay, it's something interesting just talking about insurance. I was talking to an insurance company today regarding insuring these crude vessels. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to get insurance yeah. for a crude vessel. We sell a lot of boats into bare boat for tax purposes and and also private vessels. We're selling brokerage or doing a lot of brokerage. And these owners are struggling to get insurance yeah. because the insurance companies just want to see qualifications and they want to see track records. And so interestingly enough, today I was chatting to one of the big underwriters and, you know, they're saying, look, if you're a professional crew and a professional seaman, and obviously if weather comes, most of the big boats will in any case run to get out of the way. It's not that difficult to get the insurance. Um, and the reason I got you is because crew, I see a lot of the owners are now starting to actually take a crew endorsement to ensure their crew for injury, which is something that I don't remember being in place, you know, in, 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 in five or 10 years ago. But, um, you know, just, yeah. just interesting on the insurance side. Do I tip my crew when I'm on board? <laughs> Absolutely. I've worked for tips and I can tell you, I'll tell you a little story. You know, when we did sailing schools, uh, we're from South Africa where not even waiters get tipped. And, uh, well, you know, the, 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 the English way. Yeah. And uh, so we did our first sailing school and, um, these people gave us a tip and we were absolutely outraged. What do you mean? Like, you know, what's this? Why are you tipping us? You know, <laughs> we were like really upset that we'd been tipped because we thought that our fee was enough. You know, that's what we earned. Well, the next sailing school we did, uh, we didn't get tipped. And if you think we're outraged when we, when we got tipped, <laughs> we were super outraged when we didn't get tipped. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm all about tipping. You know, the, the crew works super hard and they deserve to get tipped. If you're if you're chartering, you know, if you want to chart, if you want to do a luxury crew charter, we're able, you know, contact us. We're able to put you in touch with the right people to 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 develop and get you a really good charter set up. Um, if you're an owner and you get on your boat, uh, you're not paying for the use of the boat, but your crew rely on those tips, so you should actually be paying them the tip that they would have earned if they were out with paying guests especially owners who use their boats a lot yeah. and there's quite a few of our owners who do because they enjoy the boat that's obviously why they both bought the boat and so yeah that's that's just the courteous thing to do okay so uh the dinghy oh i can talk about that <laughs> so what's happened is dinghies like a lot of the equipment has got bigger and more sophisticated you know, even even the 48s and the 46s we're selling now have 10, 11, 12 foot center console ribs with 25, 30 horsepower engines. So if you're going to be in luxury charter, you definitely want a nice dinghy. Um, you know, if you're running people ashore, you want a decent sized engine if you're going to tow a tube with the, with your guests. But a but a really nice high end dinghy is 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 is, is has become almost an absolute must. And yeah, water toys, water toys is a big thing on, on these boats. And, and usually 
it entails the dinghy to pick up the guests and you know that sort of thing um Stephen and I for many many years as long as we've lived aboard Stephen is was adamant about just having an adequate dinghy and uh we almost you know sunk in most cases because we are the, our dinghy is too small it uh, has holes in it and, and so forth so, so finally we got this fantastic dinghy with a with a center console it's an absolute must go for it it's the best <laughs> idea i ever had <laughs> right <laughs> casey i mean you you concur right dinghies have become yeah. Important. Yeah, I've had I've had charter brokers. Um, you know, you know, I can I can post a new boat, not post the dinghy is, and they ask what what kind of dinghy is this boat going to have, and what's the horsepower? It's really important, actually, like um to them, especially if for that particular client, water sports. You know, they really want to have a towable or something. So there's been charters that you know if they if the boat is amazing but the dinghy is not sufficient, then it's a deal breaker sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, no, we're seeing that. I tell you something. We've been re-engineering davits in, in yeah. here in Fort Lauderdale like crazy. We buy the dinghy, the davits would collapse. We would get the stainless steel fabricators in, reinforce because there's no ways they're changing the dinghy. So yeah, we have well, to the Europeans, them. the Europeans don't understand ding the, the the you know Americans love big dinghies, and so they make uh, davits for adequate dinghies, and uh, it just doesn't work here in America. So uh, that was the issue. Yeah, in Europe, I mean, you can have a 50 foot boat and it's got a 10 foot dinghy with a six horsepower, go figure, yeah, but yeah. they don't have to go far, you know, I mean, Europe, the med is very different, so different cultures, but, uh, you know, we're slowly getting it together. Um, how many weeks, Casey, can we expect on these crew charter boats? Sorry, guys, I'm sitting out on the balcony and there's a, a siren going by, but um so the the goal in a season is 15 to 20 weeks per year um i have you know if you can do more than that that's great and actually some crews just really want to make a lot of money and they're gung-ho on you know doing more than that i have some that want to do 25. um also sometimes we write um into crew contracts um an incentive to encourage the crew hey your salary is based on you know 15 weeks per year or 18 weeks per year and anything over that um, you get might get an additional bonus just to encourage them to, to to do more but the goal if you have a full season and you're starting out the beginning of the season would be 15 to 20 weeks a year okay all right so guys um steven before we move on to questions this uh this uh, program whether you're an owner operator or you have a, a professional crew you can build a business around it where you can take tax tax advantages right generally if you're if you're a, if you're an owner operator you're using the tax advantages inside of your business because that's your sole source of income if you're if you're still working and you, you're in your high income years uh what a lot of people will do is they will establish a charter business with a professional crew on board and you're able to structure the business in such a way that you can use the depreciation and other tax benefits to offset taxes owed on income from other business trade or salary um, that's another entire subject uh, you know how, how to structure your, uh, the tax strategy to offset the cost of ownership it's on our website and you know if, if you want to talk about that that's definitely a, a large subject that we've been pretty uh, uh, you know successful with uh, we sold over 200 boats in the last eight years into different tax programs. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we've pretty much uh, figured out how to how to do it and be in compliance with the rules. All right, guys, so you can uh, uh, ask some questions if you want. Uh, let me just see. I've got a let me bring the chat up. I see here. Doug um, is dream the dream yachts the 15 percent broker in and how does it work uh we're not familiar with dream i, I think dream probably uh you know they, they're going to be pretty much in line with what everyone does i mean you know they're a clearing house um they they have a benefit that they are actually have a very big booking machine so there's a lot of bookings direct um, but I think even a dream, the, the preponderance of bookings is going to be through the charter brokers. The, the charter brokers are the main source of business. Um, I would say, Doug, I, I guess, you know, if you're at 30 or 33 percent, 
Uh, I, I, as I say, I don't know what their numbers are. Then you're pretty much in the ballpark, unless you want to self-manage, which of course then will drop you to about 25% of the income per charter. Okay. Um, let's see, Scott Hoyle, what is an estimate, estimate of the insurance costs? Um, I think that you can work on 2% of hull value in the luxury crude space. It's about 2.5 for bare boat, although I'm hearing that this year insurance rates are going to go up. But um, I think we're budgeting, Casey, correct me if I'm wrong, we're budgeting about 2.1%, right, of hull value? Yeah, so about 2.1% of hull value. So if you've got a million dollar boat, it's 21 grand. Um, just be real careful that when you see these policies, make sure that the deductible for named windstorms isn't outrageous. I've seen $100,000 deductibles uh, for named windstorm, which is like 10% of the hull value. Um, you know, it should be around four or five uh, for windstorm and probably about 2% for normal accidents or not normal accidents, but for any other event. And then Paul wanted to know is, uh, can you change the service location seasonally? That's for Casey. Can, yes. you, can you move the boat around seasonally? Absolutely. Um, you know, everything just needs to be um, marketed on the yachts calendar and to the to the charter brokers so that, you know, if you want to take if you want to do a split season where you're in the Bahamas part of the year, the Virgin Islands part of the year, um, that's really fine. It's just that once you get a booking in that location, you're committed to that location. So but in general, yes, you can change the location seasonally. And then that, that, of course, also helps with insurance. Uh, um, with your insurance pri uh, premium, obviously, because if you out of the hurricane belt, um, it reduces the, the insurance premium substantially. I think, Doug, you have some experience with that, right? If it's if you're north of Hatteras, uh, it, your, the insurance is pretty much halves. I just see yeah, a watermaker is a must and not that expensive. Okay. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's, yeah that's Doug. Yeah. Yeah. Now, watermakers are. Everybody should have a water maker now because yeah. the prices have come down. And you guys have mentioned a TV. Uh, TV is nice, but you're not on a trip to watch a TV. Now the crew might watch a TV, but we we are on our boat. As Steve sold us our boat. We are on our boat for like four months a year, and we never watch TV. But no, we're using is, water every day. But we do have uh, we do have a lot of people who are, um, you know, they go and do their video underwater video when they. Oh, well, but you have computers to watch that. That's what we do. You know, that's, we use our computers. That's true. It's a giant yeah. input. Yes. That's for no, sure. You, you're absolutely right. The water makers are enormous once you have one. Yeah. You I will say the TV thing, every crew knows that charter guests don't ever watch them, but it. But everyone asks for it. Like yeah. I, I actually just had to have at the last second a TV purchase just to add it on. So, you know, it was, it's a deal breaker sometimes. So even That's, though it never gets watched, if you just say you have one, it helps with, with, with the alleviation. And they are cheap. TVs yes, are great. Yeah. Sale versus power. Um, you know, sale versus power, it's amazing. This is another, I'll tell you another crazy story. I was trying to sell a Lagoon 622 to a, a client of mine. And uh, he sent me a picture of one that he thought would be perfect. And I had a look at it and I didn't have a mast on. <laughs> so I went back and I said, well, what, are you into power cats now? And he said, what do you mean? I said, that's a power cat you sent me. He said, well, let's look at it. And he ended up buying a brand new Lagoon 630 power cat and he's a converted guy. And I'll tell you what, power cats do charter well. I, I don't think that there's a downside to them because most sailboats are just motorboats with a mast. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I beg to differ, right? <laughs> I beg to differer. <laughs> right, it's nothing like moving 35 tons with no engine on. It's just a wonderful feeling. Too true. Um, yeah. uh, we have Karen asked the question, can you combine a charter with scuba? Are crews available for that? Um, I have a dive, a, a dive master on board, or would it be a separate crew member just for the scuba? That's yours, Casey. 
Oh, that's a great question, Karen. So um, there generally we would have a dive master on board be one of the crew members, either the captain or the chef, sometimes both. Um, if we have a boat that has three crew, oftentimes the third will be a dive master. That is a huge advantage. Um, otherwise, we can still offer scuba, but we do rendezvous with a local dive operation. I don't generally see that we bring on a separate crew member just for scuba unless you're on a larger vessel. That's generally not something we see in the catamaran space, um, but I, I have seen that more on the motor yacht space. Right. Casey, I, 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 I know a couple of guys who own these big cats and the one operator used to have a, 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 they were husband and wife. And what they used to advertise was a gourmet chef, which hire additional uh, when they did charters and made that an option to add, to add a gourmet chef to, to, to the crew. Is that common? To add a gourmet chef as in, in lieu of the normal chef? No, no, a third crew member. Oh. So you'd have um, a, the captain and then you'd have a professional chef on board as well. It's not incredibly common. Um, I've, I've seen it come up a few times, um, but it's not incredibly common. Okay. I mean, we can, we can pretty much, you know, if there's a certain request, we can, we try to accommodate their request, right? So if somebody has a special request and they want to bring someone on board to, you know, to, to facilitate a ceremony or something like that, we'll, we'll make it happen. Gotcha. Gotcha. So uh, Doug says we have scuba on board, but much, but too much risk to offer guests. Better to have a dive operation, just meet with the ship. Yeah, good point. Yeah, rendezvous yeah. diving is very popular in the Virgins, uh, so you don't need to carry a compressor and a, and a dive master. And of course, you have the liability. I mean, scuba diving by its very nature is dangerous. Um, so there are a lot of operators that will do rendezvous diving where they'll come to your boat, they'll pick up the they'll pick up your clients. They'll go off and they'll do the uh, they'll do the dive and bring the client back and obviously they pay a, a finder's fee for that. So guys, I just want to circle back really quickly. Um, there there are a few owner operators and I'm sure you are our owner operators or want to be our owner operators. Um, it is, it is not the easiest thing to do by yourself. Um, so we we recommend to uh, owner operators, especially if you're brand new in the business, that you you go in there with a, with a full management company, or at least with a um, um, what is the 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 booking uh, company. Clearing clearinghouse. Clearinghouse. Thank you. Um, at least sign up with the clearinghouse and have them guide you through that for at least the first year, um, just so that your the, the the booking agents get to know you, get to know your boat, and uh, make sure that you know they're not sending uh, their guests into a hellhole or or you know that your toilets don't work on the boat or something uh, weird and wonderful. So it's always a good thing to just in, in, in your first year start off with a with a good management company. Yeah, good management and a good and, and a good clearinghouse because clearinghouses have relationships with the brokers, and of course the brokers are the people that drive the business. So it's a little bit of a you know there, there, there's 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 a number of components. It's not just that easy to buy a boat, go to the Virgins, and think you're going to charter. It's not going to happen. Uh, you 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 need to have an infrastructure and you need to have some sort of support or safety net to get things going. Once you're known and once you've got a good reputation, I think you're quite quite capable of moving off on your own. Yeah, we have three couples uh, uh, and they are famous in the in the BBI. <laughs> three couples that we set up, of, um, probably two of them uh, or one of them three years ago, another couple two years ago and one last year. And they are doing great. But you know, all the all the brokers know them, they've been to the broker shows. They have all won um, uh, the shows for, uh, uh, best appetizers, best drinks, best all kinds of stuff. So they've done really, really well. And uh, in fact, they're Casey's clients now. And uh, so it, it's it's it really pays to just get yourself known before you uh, go out. You know, spread your wings. Yeah, Scott Hoyle's asking. Oh, well, that's yeah. we should you should have dealt with that for sure. <laughs> crew, crew pay, crew pay or remuneration. Generally, the old rule of thumb was $1,000 per foot per year. So if you're on a 62-foot boat, it's $62,000 per year. Um, and of course, you, you act, you're an independent contractor, so there are no benefits. But you, it's, you know, and that's the rule of thumb. 
Um, if you think about a boat, let's just say that boat goes out for 30 grand a week. And let's just say that they're mediocre. So they're getting four and a half thousand dollars tip and they do 20 weeks. That's 90 grand in tips, $62,000 in salary. It's a pretty good gig, uh, you know, for working. You, you know, don't think you're just going to work less. You're only working 20 weeks. When you do 20 weeks, you're working 35 of them prep, turnarounds, all the other work. Right. But uh, what I'm seeing is that the $1,000 per foot has kind of crept up. There's been a bit of creep there, right, Casey? Yes, Stephen, it, it definitely has went up. I mean, I think that's kind of the standard for starting out or really green crew. Um, you know, maybe somebody that just got their captain's license that, you know, has been, you know, kind of fairly, is fairly new to the charter space. Um, but yeah, I've seen it in the last few years creep up, especially I think COVID has a lot to do with that as well for U.S. captains, um, because U.S. captains know that kind of the going rate, if they're going to go work a day charter um, or even a captain only gig, uh, they're going to get like $300 a day. So, you know, they, they, they might have free room and board essentially, but at the same time, um, the, the, the industry standard has definitely increased. And then we try to, um, you know, I've kind of tried to get creative with owners lately and, and encourage incentives for performance-based bonuses and things like that to kind of get the crew really involved in being a part of that business as well. All right, and, okay. And then what are the costs for dockage during the off season? Well, uh, David, the, the, you know, during season, obviously the crew will spend as much time as they can on the anchor to avoid dockage. Um, you'd, you'd have to pay, you know, to, to pick up and drop off. Uh, you'd need to pay dockage, but otherwise the crew try and mitigate the dockage by staying on the anchor. Um, in the off season, it's pretty much the same, but you'll find that if you're going to do your annual haul out, you'll find a yard, you'll haul out, and then you'll have dock fees for two months um, while the boat's on the hard. Um, and, you know, I've seen, I've seen hard standing from a hundred bucks a day to like 250 bucks a day, depending on the yard. I think down in the islands, you're probably looking at about a, a probably a, geez, I think maybe a hundred bucks a day, Casey. What, 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 what is off season dockage in your experience? Um, I mean, it's definitely reduced. It depends on where you are. If you're in, in Grenada, you know, it's definitely a lot cheaper um, versus or hauling out versus Yacht Haven Grand, for example, in St. Thomas, it's reduced by about, you know, almost $50 a night. Um, in the off season. So it just depends, it depends on the marina and depends on where you are. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's, that, that, that's, that's a difficult one to answer. But, uh, you know, the crews are really savvy about it. They obviously are always looking at budgets and things and trying to find the best deals. You know. Why are owners more and more inclined to do the crude yachts rather than bare boats? Because I know that we've, as, as recently as two years ago, we had owners put their 50 foot Saba or 50 foot, 52 foot lagoon in bare boat charter without blinking. Well, yeah, that's, that's an, interesting, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting metamorphosis taking place where people are becoming more and more concerned about their condition of the boat at the mm -hmm. end. Look, people that do bare boat, they, the, boat, the, boats, the boats do get damaged. Uh, you know, but a lot of the damage is, is unintentional damage because people don't, you know, they're not, they're not sailing every week. And so there's, you know, forget stuff or, so a lot of it is unintentional and, 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 and not malicious. There are people that, you know, think it's a rental and so go for it. Um, but the truth is bear boats do, do, do show wear and tear. They, they have a hard life. Um, whereas a cruise boat, crude boat, after five years can basically look, I mean, I've seen crude five-year-old crude boats that look like a, look better than a brand new boat. So, and, but the, the market is starting to take much more notice of, yeah. of, of this factor. And so crude is becoming more and more popular. I mean, we, you can't believe at least 50% of the inquiries we get through here a day for, you know, tax, tax programs or, um, you know, how, how, to, how to offset the cost of ownership. Everyone will ask, but can I have a captain? That it's sort of becoming almost a more than fifty percent want captains, and it's, it has directly to do with the reputation that boats get damaged right. in bare boat charter. I mean, look, there's no free money, but uh, you know, if you if you have a good base manager and a good management company in bare boat, you should be fine. But uh, look, you know, we all know the the, the sort of track record of of, of bare boats. Uh, Doug, you had something to say. 
Um, we've gone to, we actually had crew, uh, but it was through the, uh, the broker. Um, and now we're going to our own uh, captain that will live on the boat. And Stephen is so right. I mean, some of the people out there have rented boats, you know how beat up they are. And you, anybody that complains about things not working has never chartered a yacht. They're extremely beat up. And even if you have a, um, what we found is even if you had a captain that they're changing every week, your boat gets beat up. But if you have a captain that now works for you, then the guy take the person takes care of it like it's your boat. Yeah. And it will cost you more money, but boy, your boat, when you get on it, it's in good shape. It's everything's nice. The person really takes care of it. It's a big, big uh, difference. Just, just so everyone knows, Doug's boat is called Enchante. It's a six, it's a 58, 58. foot Ipanema um, that, that they, they own as a family. And uh, he's still, <laughs> Steve, Steve and his wife sold us. Huh? <laughs> yeah. It was we like scooped this off the deck. It was like herding cats, man. <laughs> it was a, a job well done. <laughs> but it's it's been a lot of fun. We've had a blast. Um, so many great experiences. Well, it, it is. It's it's a fantastic. Once you once you go there, it's it's hard to give it up. That's for sure. Well, <laughs> we get to come home, and then you go six weeks later, a year later, and and but again, it's so nice. Uh, now that we have this. Uh, hopefully with this uh, new captain that just yeah everything's taken care of uh it's the maintenance it's boat and it's, you never know what you're gonna get back yeah yeah okay we've got another question here thank you how much should we put into reserves for planning for future maintenance engine sales bottom surface electronics Whew. You know, look, let me be quite honest with you. Any bare boat charter operation is a marginal operation. You know, if you want to make an investment, don't buy a boat. That's a depreciating asset. Um, what you're investing in with a boat is a lifestyle. And if you can break even and maybe let the boat set, uh, generate some really decent uh, tax, tax shelter or tax breaks for you, you're a winner. Um, you know, I mean, we, we, we're budgeting like, probably between, depending on the size of the boat, between 15 and 30 grand a year in maintenance. Sailboats tend to be less maintenance intensive than power boats. I don't know why, because they're basically the same. Um, but obviously, you know, electronics last a long time. Sales can last you five to 10 years. I mean, we, we sail around the world, well, not around, we sail 29,000 miles on our monohull. Mm -hmm. The one sail we had was still a sail we left Cape Town with, you know, 13 years earlier. So it just depends on usage, et cetera, et cetera. Engines last 10,000 hours. I mean, then you're not going to wear an engine out in your ownership, probably. Um, so that's a very difficult question to answer. You know, we wax our boat intensely once a year. It's a very good thing to do. It protects the boat. We haul out every year. We do the bottom. We do the anodes. We do, you know, check all the running gear, rudder bearings, etc. cetera. Um, but between 15 and 30 grand is what it, we spend per year on maintenance. Um, you know, I, I, that's I, a 54 foot boat. That's a 54 foot boat. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, no, so smaller is less. Right. Um, Karen is asking, what is the oldest boat that you would suggest for crew charter? Is there an age limit? Nine years. <laughs> no, you just pulled that out of the hat. <laughs> well, the reason, I, I think a charter boat, if it's well-maintained and well taken care of, I mean, I don't know, Casey, are those old lagoons still running around, the, 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 the 57s and that in charter? Yeah, there's a few of them. There's also some really old lepers running around. So it just, I mean, there, there's clients that have different budgets across the spectrum, right? So some of the older vessel, you know, a client might only have a $12,000 budget and, you know, I'm going to put them on an older vessel. So um, it, it's definitely still something that you can keep in, in charter. We, we've also seen, you know, uh, some of our clients on smaller boats, it's a little older, um, that they live aboard. And what we suggest to them, 
um, instead of doing the full luxury experience, is uh, do participation uh, participation charters where the the guests come on board and they learn about sailing. They on you know they're not being taught to sail, but they learn about sailing, learn about the operation of a boat, and just generally participate. Uh, you know, help cooking and cleaning and so forth. And that uh, you know they charge less, but it's a lot less stressful. And the the clients don't expect a brand new boat, a uh, luxury mm -hmm. boat. Karen, I think to answer your question, I don't think a 10 year old boat that's been in crude its entire life is actually old. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, we live in a society where model year is an important aspect of our life because you look at cars and all the rest of it. Boats are infinitely refurbishable, so it doesn't really apply, but the, but the, the culture is for newer boats. So let's take a Lagoon 620. A brand new Lagoon 620 is going to charter for more than a 10 year old Lagoon 620. But they go, they both going to be chartering, chartering in the sort of low, low to mid 30,000s, maybe 28,000. So it's feasible to charter about probably through 15 years old, I would say, successfully, um, yeah. that it would, you know, that it would carry its own weight. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, with that, uh, we, we're going to call it a day. As I said, you know, we're here, we're available, we're accessible. If you want to talk to us about buying a boat, if you want to talk to us about actually chartering a boat, uh, you know, we're, we're able to help with all these things. We, we, we deal with most, most suppliers or vendors. So, you know, hopefully we can direct you in the right direction. But uh, I'd like to thank you very much all for joining us. And uh, <laughs> once again, Catamaran Guru is a community. So, you know, we're all in the same boat. Love to share it with everybody. Um...